Good morning. I hereby call to order this 10th meeting of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission for the year 2017 and ask that you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first matter for this morning's agenda is the approval of the minutes of May 4th, 2017, and I will call upon Commissioner Powelson, who is the editor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I've reviewed the minutes from the May 4th public meeting and recommend that they be approved as submitted here this morning. You have heard the motion for the approval of the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chairman Place. Any discussion, further edits? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. This time we'll call upon our director of the Office of Special Assistance, Cheryl Walker Davis, to lead us through this morning's agenda. Uh, good morning, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, may it please this honorable commission on behalf of your various offices and bureaus, we present for your consideration and disposition the following agenda items, commencing this morning with matters on behalf of the Bureau of Audits. It is recommended that the commission adopt on page one of the public meeting agenda the two recommendations for the release of audit reports in the matters involving the UGI Utilities, Inc. Electric Division's Customer Assistance Program for the noted years, as well as the Telecommunications Relay Service Program Administration and Fund Activity Report for the 12 months uh, uh, noted for the various Years. Is there a motion to adopt staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? <clears throat> second. Motion by Commissioner Sweet, second by Commissioner Powelson. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Office of Special Assistance, <laughs> it is recommended that the commission adopt the recommendations appearing on page two of the public meeting agenda through and including the recommendation to note the, uh, the notational vote conducted by the commission on May the 30th in the matter involving UGI Central Pan Gas Inc.'s uh, distribution system improvement charge proceeding. Is there a motion to adopt the staff, re uh, the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Coleman, second by Commissioner Sweet. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. Turning now to the application of the Aqua Pennsylvania Wastewater Inc. for a certificate of public convenience to acquire the wastewater system and related assets of the New Gorton Township and New Gorton Township Sewer Authority, appearing on page three, we note the motion of Commissioner Powelson as well as the statement of Vice Chairman Place. Is there a motion to call up the staff recommendation for consideration? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Sweet, second by Commissioner Coleman. Under discussion, I would call on Commissioner Powelson for his motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. For the commission here this morning is the application to approve the acquisition of the wastewater system asset of New Garden Township and the New Garden Township Sewer Authority. This is a case of first impression under the newly enacted Section 1329 to the Public Utility Code. The key consideration here this morning is the relationship between this new provision and our traditional review of acquisitions under Section 1102 of the Code. Pursuant to Section 1329, the Commission is asked to establish a rate-based valuation, but not rates. If approved, the $29.5 million acquisition price negotiated by Aqua will be incorporated into Aqua's rate base during the next rate, excuse me, during its next base rate case. Aqua's purchase price of $29.5 million is lower than the average appraised values as adjusted by the ALJ of $29.9 million and therefore is below the statutory ceiling valuation a point that should not, be, uh, should not go unnoticed here this morning. Now, I agree with Aqua that there are public benefits to this transaction under Section 1102 and 1103 of the Code. These sections of the Code require that the applicant demonstrate that the pr proposed acquisition will affirmatively promote the service, accommodation, convenience, or safety of the public in some substantial way. 
Finally, I believe that we must defer to the General Assembly's clear support and encouragement of municipal wastewater acquisition at valuation levels higher than traditional original cost measures. Aqua has also filed a tariff containing a rate equal to the existing rates of the selling utility at the time of the acquisition as the code requires. These existing rates were set by the new garden board of supervisors and were not designed under traditional rate base rate of return principles. Thus, we do not know how these new garden costs will reconcile to those of aqua or traditional rate making. I am concerned with the potential future cross subsidization of new garden customers by current aqua customers, although the record is not all developed on that particular issue, nor is it required to be. The record does show, however, that Aqua's average net plant of $3,714 um, $3, per customer is approximately four times lower than that of New Garden's $14,000 per customer, indicating more economic capital utilization is going to be required by Aqua in this transaction. This may suggest that the current rates in New Garden, when reconciled to the rate-based rate of return model, potentially could be much higher than those rates presented, uh, presently established for Aqua's existing customers. A commission order approving the transaction is permitted to include additional conditions of approval. Accordingly, as a condition to approval of this acquisition, I move that Aqua be directed to file a cost of service analysis in its next base rate case proceeding, similar to the outcome we directed in this Granton case. As a result, all parties and the Commission will be informed of the overall rate impact on Aqua customers and alternatively the results of establishing New Garden as a separate rate zone. In addition to the cost of service study requirement, I also continue to agree with the Scranton decision when it comes to rate assurances. The asset purchase cost, the APA, in this case includes provisions relating to Aqua's assurances that it will freeze the rates charged to New Garden customers for approximately two years and thereafter limit rate increases for New Garden customers to an annual rate of 4% over the next 10 years. In the Scranton case, the APA simply limited the rate assurances to what the utility might propose, not the final outcome. <coughs> Here, the APA provide, provides firm Unqual unqualified guarantees. Aqua acknowledges that the Commission will ultimately decide the appropriate rates for the customers of the acquired utility in Aqua's next best base, excuse me, in Aqua's next base rate case proceeding. Aqua asks that we render no ruling on this private contract provision, and I see no reason to disagree with them. In conclusion, the benefits outlined by Aqua as well as the requirement for Aqua to include in its next base rate case <clears throat> cost of service study relevant to New the New Garden system and the determination that the rate assurances offered between Aqua and New Garden are not binding on the rate making authority of this commission and it will work in tandem to satisfy the requirements of chapters 11 and 13 of the code. <laughs> Therefore, I move that for one, the commission approve the application and set the resulting rate base at $29.5 million. The second, Aqua shall file a cost of service analysis in their next base rate case proceeding that separates the cost, capital, and operating expenses of providing wastewater service to New Garden Township customers as a separate rate class. The third, Aqua will file an analysis in their next base rate case proceeding that addresses the effects of designing New Garden rates as a separate standalone rate zone. The fourth, Aqua and its shareholders shall bear all risk of a shortfall between revenues it's permitted to recover under its asset purchase agreement with New Garden Township and the cost that Aqua will incur with respect to the required system. To that extent, Aqua, to the extent that Aqua is unwilling or unable to charge cost in excess of the limitations provided in the asset purchase agreement, the, ex the excess cost should be borne by shareholders and not spread amongst other ratepayers. And finally, that the Office of Special Assistance prepare an opinion and order consistent with this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Powelson. You have heard his motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Sweet. Any discussion on his motion? Vice Chairman, please. 
Thank you very much. Madam Secretary, I'd like to place my statement on the record as if I'd read it in its entirety. I first would like to commend Administrative Law Judge Haas for effectively presiding and exhaustively analyzing an adversarial and complex matter of first impression. <clears throat> I also want to thank our Office of Special Assistance Advisory staff for carefully analyzing the record and the various initial and reply exceptions submitted by interested parties in this proceeding. The aggregate staff effort, including the substantive participation of our Bureau of Investigation Enforcement, is duly noted, particularly as the underlying evidentiary proceeding has, been taken, has taken place within the statutorily prescribed but narrow time frame of six months. <clears throat> in my opinion, ALJ Haas correctly analyzed both the facts and the applicable law in this recommended decision. The synergistic operation of applicable statutory sections of the Public Utility Code and the available evidentiary record do not support any form of approval for the present application under an underlying transaction. <clears throat> The relevant legal analysis here cannot be largely based on the legislative intent of the newly enacted Action th Section 1329 of the Public Utility Code that focuses on the rate-based valuation of acquired municipal or municipal authority water and wastewater systems by investor-owned utilities or other entities. ACWA must demonstrate that the pr proposed acquisition produces net affirmative benefits in accordance with the requirements of sections 1102 and 1103 of the applicable court, uh, sorry, an applicable court president. The existence of these af net affirmative benefits involves not only the end user consumers of the acquired entity, but also ACWA's existing ratepayers. The available and credible evidence of record does not demonstrate the presence of such net affirmative benefits, especially for existing aqua ratepayers. The alleged affirmative benefits put forward by aqua are rather speculative and will, if then, accrue over a very long time. A 100-year horizon is an extraordinary length of time for the generation of net affirmative benefits. The record evidence shows that the New Garden Sewer Authority is a financially stable entity that is capable of continuing to operate the system in an efficient and economical manner. Merely stating that the transaction will promote consolidation and regionalization does not adequately explain how this constitutes an affirmative public benefit to New Gardens and Aqua's existing customers. In contrast, the fair market value of the acquisition price for the assets of New Garden Township and the New Garden Township Sewer Authority will cause tangible costs and concrete revenue requirements for both the ratepayers of New Garden and Aqua. It is significant to point out that the fair market value of the acquisition price at $29.5 million exceeds the net book value of or original cost of the New Garden system by $10.9 million or approximately 59%. ALJ Haas notes that if the acquisition price is divided among the existing 2,106 customers of the new garden system, the result is a new rate-based addition of $14,007 per customer. I acknowledge the efforts of my colleagues to introduce certain and prospectively applicable rate-making additions in the outcome of the proposed transaction. However, I have serious doubts whether such conditions will provide concrete and sustainable safeguards while protecting the broader public interest and particularly the interests of Aqua's existing customer base. I also agree with ALJ Haas's legal conclusion that, inter that interested parties can appropriately examine and challenge the fair market valuation methods and results for the assets of water and wastewater systems that are slated for acquisition under sections 1329, section 1329. This approach is fully consistent with the statutory fact-finding role of this commission. I understand that New Garden wishes to sell its wastewater system and that Aqua is a willing buyer. However, this commission has a statutory charge to carry out a proper analysis of the proposed transaction and ascertain with confidence whether it produces net affirmative benefits and serves the broader public interest. The evidentiary record and the in-depth analysis of ALJ Haas in his recommended decision clearly demonstrate that Aqua has failed to sustain its burden of proof in this proceeding. Therefore, I believe that Aqua's ap application should be denied. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Place any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, on the motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Noting the uh, motion passes four to one, noting the dissent of Vice Chairman Place on the staff recommendation as amended. If there's no objection, we'll take the previous roll call. Seeing none, the staff recommendation as amended passes four to one, noting the dissent of Vice Chairman Place. 
it is recommended that the Commission adopt the Office of Special Assistance recommendation with regard to the joint petition for approval of interconnection agreement uh, filed by the United Telephone Company of Pennsylvania LLC, DBA CenturyLink, and Neutral Tandem Pennsylvania LLC. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Vice Chairman Play, second by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Commission's Bureau of Technical Utility Services, it is recommended that the commission, the commission adopt the recommendation with regard to the first matter pertaining to the Peagle Energy Company's second modified gas long-term infrastructure improvement plan, noting the statement of Vice Chairman Place. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Sweet. <coughs> Under discussion, I recognize Vice Chairman Place. Thank you. Madam Secretary, I ask that my statement be entered into the record as if I'd read it in its entirety. Before the Commission for Consideration is the petition for approval of the second modified gas long-term infrastructure improvement plan of PICO Energy Company. PICO's second modified LTIP is a 10-year plan spanning the years 2013 through 2022 with two major changes that build upon PICO's first modified LTIP. The first change is an increase in infrastructure spending designed to maintain PICO's rate of infrastructure improvement while managing increasing construction costs. Under the instant LTIP, PICO still plans to replace all of its targeted at-risk pipe within 20 years. In addition, sorry, in order to maintain this accelerated pace, PICO will increase its average spending level from 61 million per year to 92 million per year. The second major change made in PICO's second modified LTIP is an increase in the rate of service line replacement for the remainder of the LTIP period. PICO has been falling short of its LTIP targets for the replacement of bare steel services. PICO's second modified LTIP addresses this shortfall by increasing the service line replacement target for the remainder of the LTIP. PICO averts this will ensure that all bare steel services will be removed within the 20 year time frame. The underlying cause of this increase in costs is related to several factors, including higher mainline replacement contractor costs related to increased industry replacement activity combined with the related labor and contractor constraints. PICO also identified an additional contributor to higher projected construction costs, noting that a number of townships in which it, do, it is doing construction work have recently changed their ordinances regarding road restoration requirements for utility excavations. These changes have frequently resulted in increased costs due to supplementary mill and overlay requirements. PICO provided specific examples in which the requirements of new ordinances raised the cost of milling and overlay work by 52% to 122%. Given the importance and cost to upgrade and replace the Commonwealth's aging natural gas infrastructure, it is critical that this effort be completed in the most cost-effective manner. Pursuant to the Commission's statute, only reasonable and prudent costs are recoverable and rates to customers. Additionally, as a matter of simple economics and public interest, it is not prudent to unreasonably shift road upkeep costs from municipalities to natural gas customers as utilities earn a, rate, earn a return of and on infrastructure costs, whereas municipalities only charge a return of infrastructure costs. It is incumbent upon PICO to make all reasonable efforts to minimize municipally imposed restoration costs as PICO has not guaranteed recovery of all LTIP costs, only those prudently incurred. This is not a case of first impression. Both Columbia Gas of Pennsylvania and UGI Utilities Incorporated Gas Division and its affiliates have been successfully addressing efforts by municipalities to unreasonably shift costs to utility ratepayers. I encourage PICO to reach out to these peer utilities to examine their best practices and lessons learned. In, in summary, I emphasize that PICO should adopt as appropriate these best practices in order to collaboratively mitigate unreasonable increases in restoration costs and fees imposed by municipalities. It is incumbent upon PICO, sorry, likewise, it is incumbent upon PICO to ensure that its restoration work as coordinated with municipalities is completed satisfactorily to ensure that PICO is not imposing reasonable costs on municipalities. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman Place. Is there any further comments for the record? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Motion passes five to zero.
it is recommended that the commission adopt the Bureau of Technical Utility Services recommendations in the matter involving the Metropolitan Edison Company, Pennsylvania Electric Company, and Pennsylvania Power Companies <coughs> petitions seeking approval of their long-term infrastructure improvement plans. Sir, a motion to adopt the staff recommendation. So moved. Sir, a second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. It is recommended that the commission adopt the various matters filed on behalf of the Mid-Atlantic Interstate Transmission LLC as well as Trans-Allegheny Interstate Line Company uh, pertaining to the Pierce Brook Lewis Run 230 KV transmission line, noting the statement of Commissioner Sweet. Is there a motion to adopt staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Vice Chairman Place, second by Commissioner Paulson. Under discussion, I would recognize Commissioner Sweet for his statement. Thank you. Uh, before joining my staff as legal counsel, Susan Colwell was working in the Office of Administrative Law Judge and worked on this case in her capacity as an ALJ. Please note she has not advised me on this matter. Thank you. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes 5-0. In omnibus fashion, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the various recommendations, commencing with that appearing at the bottom of page four pertaining to the PPL Electric Utilities Corporation, a Susquehanna Jenkins 230 kV transmission line in Luzerne County, and continuing with all of the recommendations on pages five, six, through and including the three recommendations appearing on page seven, the last one pertaining to U.S. LEC of Pennsylvania LLC, DBA, uh, Paytech Business Services. Is there a motion to adopt staff recommendations? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Sweet, second by Commissioner Powelson. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. It is recommended that the commission adopt the staff recommendations appearing in the next four matters pertaining to the various Windstream affiliates uh, 2017 price stability index service price index reports that so we're commencing with the last item at the bottom, bottom of page seven and going through the third item on page eight that being Windstream Pennsylvania LLC. Sarah motion to adopt staff recommendations. So moved. Sarah second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, I'm opposed. Thank you. Motion passes four to one, noting the dissent of Commissioner Sweet. It is recommended that the commission adopt the staff recommendation in the matter involving the Consolidated Communications of Pennsylvania Company's 2017 Annual Price Stability Index Service Price Index Report, noting the statement of Vice Chairman Place. Is there a motion to adopt staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Coleman. Under discussion, I recognize Vice Chairman Place for his statement. Thank you. Madam Secretary, I ask that my statement be entered into the record as if I'd read it in its entirety. Before us for disposition is the Consolidated Communications of Pennsylvania Company's 2017 Price Stability Index and Service Price Index Submission and the Associated Annual Revenue and rate increase request. This submission has been made under Chapter 30 of the Public Utility Code and the company's alternative regulation and network modernization plan. I feel, fully understand that Chapter 30 incumbent local exchange carriers such as Consolidated must be and are cognizant of relative price elasticities of demand on how they apply rate increases to their regulated services. These considerations also affect how the routine annual Chapter 30 revenue increases are allocated among the regulated services of these ILECs. <clears throat> I observe that the 2017 PSI SPI annual revenue increase of, of 199,230 is applied only to residential basic local exchange services. Although the company's approach reflects previous filings in recent years, I would encourage Consolidated to consider the partial allocation of these annual Chapter 30 revenue increases to additional regulated services consistent with applicable Pennsylvania and federal law and its alternative regulation and network modernization plan. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Place any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. The motion passes four to one, noting the dissent of Commissioner Sweet. 
It is recommended that the Commission adopt the staff recommendations with regard to the 2017 Price Stability Index Service Price Index uh, reports of the Northeastern Pennsylvania Telephone Company, appearing at the bottom of page 8, as well as the first two on page, page 9, pertaining to Hickory Telephone Company and Bentleyville Communications Corporation doing business <coughs> as Fair, Fairpoint Communications. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendations? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Palson. I heard joint seconds. <laughs> John, it's all John's. <laughs> Second by Commissioner Coleman. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Motion passes four to one, noting the, noting the dissent of Commissioner <coughs> Excuse me. It is recommended that the Commission adopt the staff recommendation in the matter involving the Lackawaxen Telecommunication Services, Inc., 2017 Price Stability Index Service Price Index Report, noting the statements of Commissioners Coleman, <coughs> Commissioner Powelson, and Commissioner Sweet. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Coleman. Under discussion, who would like to go first? <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> I'll go. Commissioner Powelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, matter before us here this morning involves the annual price filing by Lax Awaxen. Is that correct? Cheryl, help me. Lacko waxen. Lacko waxen. Lacko waxen. Lacko Thank you. That's <laughs> Sort of like your kitchen floor, lacko waxen. <laughs> Let me start over. Good morning. The, the matter before us involves the annual price cap filing for lacko waxen telecommunications <laughs> services. <laughs> which includes its annual 2017 annual price stability index report and tariff supplement filing. The company proposes to increase rates for residential and business uh, one party lines by $2 per month, a total revenue increase of $38,208. For residential customers, the company's uh, one party line rate would become $19 per month, which is under the federal um, uh, price cap. The company's rate mechanisms are controlled by the commission's approved terms of its Chapter 30 plan. The PSI calculates Laxawaxen's annual allowable charge in regulated rates, i.e. non-competitive services, based on a change of inflation as measured by the GDPI, Gross Domestic Product Price Index. Changes in rates are tracked by the SPI. Under the plan, the cumulative change in rates over the life of the plan may be increased up to, but may not exceed, the cumulative rate of inflation captured in the PSI. This difference in the PSI and the SPI is an ongoing opportunity if not taken, and it's preserved for use in the following years, but not on a prospective basis only. In addition, not in substitution of this mechanism, Laxawaxen is Permit it to bank the increase not taken in the first years as a discrete non-recurring dollar value. Some may argue that the commission should limit the increase to this year's change in the PSI value plus the amount of the cumulative revenues included in the bank. Under this method, Laxawaxen proposed new rates would be denied because there is insufficient money in the mechanism to fund the, the potential increase. I disagree with this outcome for two basic reasons. First, the bank has been incorrectly administered in most recent history of our tracking of allowable changes. Limiting the banking calculation to three year to a three year tracking system and denying Laxawaxen a full four year allowed under its plan is an incorrect approach in my opinion. The current year PSI opportunity does not become part of the bank until the current year filing is made and disposed of by the commission. Second point that needs to be made here this morning is I disagree with denying Laxawax and the right to increase rates up to the current PSI of 125.6. Since the current SPI before the increase is 109.3, there's more than enough headroom to raise rates. 
This is the foundation of the price cap formula and not permitting this increase to occur is inconsistent with the plan and improperly places restrictions on what should be fairly straightforward, what should be a fairly straightforward exercise. Laxa Waxon served the filing upon the statutory parties, and so the public was informed of the proposed $2 rate increase, and no one had objected. Laxa Waxon is in a competitive business and subject to competitive pricing constraints. If the rate is too high, Laxa Waxon will lose business customers and residential customers. Moreover, at $19 per month, the resulting rate is in the middle of the other local rates in Pennsylvania and below the federal benchmark, as I alluded to earlier. The proposed rate is clearly just and reasonable. It is the distortion of the price cap formula and the accounting confusion that forms the basis of the proposed denial of the increase here this morning. I would approve the increase and revise our internal methodology so that it will be more accurate, so that it more accurately reflects the original formula, both in its words and its intent. My fellow commissioners and commission staff have struggled with these issues and the effort has raised our collective understanding of this issue here this morning. I would like to also um, associate myself with the excellent analysis that's contained in a pending statement by Commissioner Sweet on banking and his proposed outcome on this particular topic. I also sympathize with the dilemma described, what will be described in Commissioner Coleman's statement and urge the parties to address this issue to remove any possible ambiguity. These steps will help the commission get the <coughs> cap formula back where it is meant to be. And therefore, um, Madam Chair, I'm gonna be respectfully voting no on this recommended outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Powelson. Commissioner Sweet. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I mercifully ask that my nine-page statement <laughs> be entered into the record as if fully read. Uh, this case involves the, ninth, the 2017 annual filing of the Chapter 30 Plan Price Stability Index, or PSI, and Service Price Index, or SPI, reported by Lackawax and Telecommunications Services, Inc., a small rural telecommunications carrier providing service in Pike County, Pennsylvania. I dissent today with respect to the Lackawaxon 2017 PSI filing because only in this case was it apparent that premature elimination of the four-year banked amounts worked as a hardship to the company. The issue I raise today, however, seems to have applicability beyond this company and sort of explains my earlier negative votes. Lackawaxon's Chapter 30 plan was approved in 2000 following the filing of a joint petition by it and 18 other of Pennsylvania's smallest and most rural local exchange carriers in 1998. The PSI slash SPI report is the company's annual opportunity to seek commission approval of a revenue increase under its Chapter 30 plan. That annual opportunity, however, comes with a, quote, four consecutive year, close quote, banking provision as also approved in the company's plan. In a most unusual situation presented in Lackawaxon's pending 2017 PSI filing, the company has found itself with insufficient banked and currently calculated PSI revenue increase amounts to implement the increase it proposes. For this reason, staff finds that the 2017 PSI filing to be inconsistent with the company's approved 2030 plan. I have reviewed, and in my full nine-page statement, painstakingly laid out, the provisions in the company's four-year, four-consecutive-year banking provision. The company's PSI filings from its inaugural filing in 2006. Through the matter pending before us, the company's proposals with respect to the banking use and lapsing of deferred increases and our orders approving those historic PSI filings. <laughs> Upon that review, I find that through 2012, the company and the commission consistently interpreted and applied the four-year bank provision to allow for an increase authorized but banked to be held and available for use through and including in the PSI filing made after the conclusion of four consecutive years. I also find that for no reason apparent in the 2013 or subsequent filings, 
nor explained in our 2013 or subsequent orders, nor provided for in any revision to the company's plan, the interpretation and application of the company's banking provision changed to the company's detriment in 2013. That change was inconsistent with our past approved orders and contributes to the company and our predicament today. I recognize that staff interprets the company's banking provision differently. However, based on the company's past filings and our past approvals through 2012, and without any explanation for a change, I believe the accurate interpretation of a four-year bank is that the company must have the opportunity to use a banked increase up through the fifth anniversary date of its approved bank. To illustrate for the sake of simplicity, if it were to approve for the company a one-year bank in 2017, by necessity, the company would have to be able to use the 2017 authorized revenue increase in 2018, or else the one-year bank would be illusory. The same construct must apply to the company's approved four-year bank. Otherwise, it is, in effect, really only of three years' duration. For these reasons, I dissent from the majority's approval of staff's recommendations regarding Lackawaxen's currently pending 2017 PSI approval. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sweet. Commissioner Coleman. Well, thank you, Chairman. I first want to begin by thanking our uh, TUS staff and our law bureau staff. As you see this morning, we have a number of these price stability index cases before us, and as indicated in the statements, these can be fairly complex. So I want to thank the staff for helping us navigate through. Um, I would summarize this this morning as this is really a math and a process uh, matter for us this morning. I don't know that I would necessarily object to some of the comments that have been made by both Commissioners Powelson and Sweet. Um, but uh, with that being said, let me ask that my statement be entered into the record as though I read it in its entirety. The filing before us, Lack of Waxen, proposes to increase rates for residential and business one-party lines by $2 per month, which would amount to a total rate increase of approximately $38,000. However, as noted in my written statement, while the proposed rate increase appears to be reasonable, I do not believe that it is consistent with the company's commission-approved Chapter 30 plan. Therefore, I agree with the staff recommendation to allow a $20,492 increase instead of which appears to be consistent with the company's plan. Mm. My written statement acknowledges that these filings raise several legitimate issues about how the commission addresses certain aspects of the rate increase request from our rural ILEX. These issues may be discussed further by my colleagues here today. However, my statement explains why I believe that this is not the right time or place to address these issues. Rather, I believe that these issues should be addressed through the Chapter 30 plan amendment process where they can be vetted thoroughly and transparently. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. Any further discussion? Mm. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. opposed. The motion passes three to two, noting the, the, the dissent of Commissioner Powelson and Commissioner Sweet. Continuing, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the staff recommendation in the matter involving the 2017 Price Stability Index Service Price Index Report of the Mariana and Scenery Hill Telephone Company doing business as Fairpoint Communications. Mm. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Vice Chairman Play, second by Commissioner Powelson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. The motion passes four to one, noting the dissent of Commissioner Sweet. In omnibus fashion, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the remaining recommendations of the Bureau of Technical Utility Services, commencing with that appearing at the bottom of page nine in the matter involving the Pennsylvania Telephone Company's petition to eliminate the negative state tax adjustment surcharge and simplified rate plan filing and accompanying uh, tariff supplement, and continuing to include all of the recommendations on pages 10. 11 and 12 through and including the Newtown Artesian Water Company Security Certificate uh, recommendation. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendations? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Coleman, second by Commissioner Sweet. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. 
Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Law Bureau, appearing on page 13, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the two items there appearing pertaining to the petition for declaratory order involving the Borough of Driftwood, as well as the advance notice of proposed rulemaking pertaining to the regulation of motor carriers of passengers and property. Is there a motion to adopt staff recommendations? So move. Sarah, second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Paulson, second by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. And now turning to matters presented on behalf of the Commission's Office of Administrative Law Judge, commencing on page 14 of the public meeting agenda, it is recommended that the Commission adopt ALJ Jones's recommended decision in the matter involving the uh, PennDOT uh, application to reconstruct an above grade bridge in uh, Lower Chichester Township in Marcus Hookborough, Delaware County. Is there a motion to adopt a staff recommendation? So moved. Sarah, second. 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 Motion by Vice Chairman Place. You hear joint seconds. Which one was louder? No. Commissioner Coleman. I got one for Commissioner <clears throat> Coleman, so you're the second. <laughs> um, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> the motion passes five to zero. With regard to the complaint of Robert M. Matu versus West Penn Power Company, there is the joint motion that you have, Madam Chairman, along with Commissioner Sweet, as well as the joint statement of Commissioners Coleman and Paulson. Do we have a motion to call up the staff recommendation for consideration? So moved. There is, is there a second? Second. Most invite, motion by Vice Chairman Play, second by Commissioner Sweet to call up the matter for consideration. Under discussion, I would recognize Commissioner Sweet to do the joint motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I ask our motion be placed upon the record as if I had read it in its entirety. Let me summarize. Before us uh, is consideration and review of a formal complaint filed by Robert M. Matu against West Bend Power Company and the initial decision of Administrative Law Judge Katrina Dunderdahl. Mr. Matu owns and lives on property that has a 138 kV transmission line crossing on a right-of-way that measures approximately 200 feet long by 100 feet wide. He objects to West Penn Power's proposal to clear this right-of-way in a manner that includes the use of herbicides because his house, fish pond, and the spring and two shallow wells providing the sole source of water to his home are located less than 25 yards down a slope from the right-of-way. The ALJ's analysis and findings were thorough and consistent with commission precedent. And this commission has dismissed numerous cases seeking the same exception from the use of herbicides on transmission rights of way. This case, however, presents unique circumstances which justify a finding that the use of herbicides is not consistent with the landowner's ability to utilize his property safely, but in a way which does not prevent the utility from engaging in the industry's accepted practice of the proper use of herbicides. In fact, the subject matter of this complaint is more in the nature of a petition for relief than a complaint. This commission regularly treats a document or pleading as what it is rather than what it is labeled, and we will do so here. This complaint is really in the nature of a petition for relief, granted here to prevent the use of herbicides so close to the source of the household's water. As the parties have been afforded a full opportunity to litigate the case, and they have done so, and as the burden of proof would not change if the filing had been labeled a petition upon its filing, there is no prejudice to any party to treating it today in the nature of a petition. We emphasize that this conclusion is fact-specific, not intended to create a bright-line standard for evaluating future cases. In addition, as this is now a petition, the applicable regulation calls for notification of the statutory advocates. The commission order will be issued as a tentative order to give the advocates an opportunity to enter an appearance and seek additional proceedings if they so choose. Accordingly, we move, number one, that the initial decision in this matter be reversed in part, affirmed in part, consistent with this motion. 
Two, that West Penn Power Company is directed to forego the use of herbicides on the right-of-way crossing Mr. Matu's land without his permission. Three, that the Office of Special Assistance prepare an appropriate tentative order, which provides for 30 days from the date of entry of the tentative order for the Office of Consumer Advocate, the Office of Small Business Advocate, and the Commission's Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement to file for intervention and request for additional proceedings. That if four, that if no statutory advocate has filed a notion of intervention and request for additional proceedings within 30 days of the entry date of the tentative order, then the tentative order shall become final. Thank you. You have heard the joint motion as read by Commissioner Sweet. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chairman Place. Under discussion, I recognize Commissioner Coleman for the joint statement. Well, thank you, Chairman. From time to time, we have cases that come before us that cause pause, and um, this case is certainly one of those cases this morning that uh, I believe warrants a little bit more explanation. So I'm going to ask for your indulgence this morning. I have a fairly lengthy dissenting statement that uh, I'm entering into the record, ask that it be entered into the record jointly with Commissioner Powelson. Before the commission is the initial decision denying the formal complaint filed against West Penn Power Company. The complaint objects to the West Penn's use of herbicides to prevent the regrowth of trees within the interstate transmission line right away located on the complainant's property. The presiding administrative law judge determined that the complainant failed to meet his burden of proof that the use was unsafe or unreasonable and that the complainant should therefore be dismissed. The joint motion proposes to modify the initial decision and grant the complainant his requested relief. As we agree with the initial decision, we will be descending from the joint motion. Before we review the relevant particulars of the case, we think it would be useful to outline the areas where we agree with the joint motion. First, we agree that the administrative law judge applied the appropriate commission case precedent and committed no error of law or fact in reaching her conclusions to dismiss this complaint. Secondly, we agree that West Penn's actions and proposed actions are consistent with the commission's approved election, uh, electric, electric facilities inspection and maintenance plan. Third, we agree that West Penn's conduct and proposed conduct was otherwise in compliance with all commission regulations and orders and the provisions of the public utility code. Fourth, we agree that there was no violation of 16, section 1501, which governs the safety and reliability of public utility service, and which is the basis for our jurisdiction to hear this dispute. As West Penn is not in violation of 1501, we must conclude that the conduct and proposed use of herbicides was safe and reasonable. If the commission finds that West Penn's conduct is safe and reasonable and thus is in compliance with 1501, the formal complaint must be dismissed. We are unaware of any existing statutory authority or case precedent that allows the commission to impose a higher standard of section 1501 by which we decide such cases. To expand on this point, we are in full agreement with prior, with prior court decisions that the commission is not a super board of directors for public utilities. When a public utility is hearing to its tariff and acting in compliance with all orders and all regulations of the commission and the provisions of the public utility code, we find that any associated actions are occurring within a regulatory, quote, safe harbor. Accordingly, the public utility has the discretion to provide service as we see, as it sees fit on that issue. In those circumstances, the commission may not micromanage the day-to-day -day operations of the public utility or decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether a public utility may engage in certain practices that are otherwise in full accord with the law. Where the commission feels that section 1501 alone does not adequately delineate what a public utility safe and reliable obligations may be, the proper course is to initiate a rulemaking proceeding. The commission does have extensive regulations governing the safe and reliability of electric utility service. In its enactment of the Electric Electricity Generation Customer Choice and Competition Act, the Pennsylvania General Assembly expressed a preference that electric reliability standards be addressed through the regulations and that they be in conformity with established industry standards. 
Let me quote from several provisions of the Act first. Since continuing and ensuring that reliability of electric service depends on adequate generation and the conscientious inspection of maintenance of transmission and distribution systems, the Commission shall set forth regulations, inspection, maintenance, repair, and replacement standards and enforce those standards. In another section, the General Assembly said the Commission shall ensure continuation of safety and reliable electric service to all consumers in the Commonwealth, including the installation and maintenance of transmission and distribution facilities in conformity and established industry standards and practices including standards set forth by the National Electric Safety Code. We now turn to the particulars of the facts of this case and explain why we are in agreement with the ALJ's decision. The complainant's property is a residential service address. The service address receives its water supply from two wells located approximately 70 feet from the right-of-way. West Penn has maintained a 100-foot wide right-of-way at the location since 1968, on which it has constructed a 138 kV electric transmission line. West Penn visits this right-of-way on a five-year cycle, inspects and removes incompatible vegetation. In 2015, a West Penn contractor notified the complainant that the plan was used a herbicide to control incompatible vegetation within the right-of-way. The West Penn's work plan at the service address was to do a, quote, cut stump application, which involves cutting all incompatible trees and bushes within the unmaintained portion of the right-of-way and then having an individual manually apply herbicide directly to the outer edge of the stumps. The complainant objected to the use of herbicides given his personal concern about their effect on the water supply. West Penn attempted to address the complainant's concerns by having its transmission forestry specialist and later a representative of Dow Chemical Company, the manufacturer of the herbicide, to visit his property and assess the proposed work plan and need for herbicides. Initially, West Penn attempted to maintain the right-of-way by hand-cutting trees and vegetation. A follow-up visit demonstrated significant regrowth of the stumps and the incompatible vegetation had to be treated with herbicides. West Penn determined that the incompatible vegetation growth rate would quickly evade, invade the minimum clearance required for the transmission line. After West Penn notified the complainant of his intent to use herbicide, complainant filed a formal complaint. As with any formal proceeding, the complaint as the moving party has the burden of proof by a preponderance of evidence that West Penn proposed use of herbicides within the transmission line right away violates some provision of the Public Utility Code, a commission order or regulation. In this matter, the complainant merely testified as to his general concern that the herbicide would leach into the well water and fish pond. On the other hand, West Penn presented exhibits and introduced the testimony of three witnesses. These witnesses included a forestry, a forestry specialist who visited the complainant's property and another one who participated in drafting the West Penn's vegetation management program standards. The presiding AOJ qualified these witnesses as experts in the application of herbicides and identification of incompatible vegetation, modes of herbicide action, and the environmental impacts and safety herbicides. After a review of the evidentiary record, we believe that the West Penn's intended use of herbicides here is reasonable and consistent with all applicable commission precedent. We do not believe that the complaint met its burden of proof to show otherwise, and we agree with the decision of the presiding ALJ to dismiss the formal complaint. Our conclusion is based on the following record evidence provided at hearing through the exhibits and witness testimony. West Penn is required to have a transmission vegetation maintenance program in order to satisfy its federally mandated reliability obligations, which are developed and enforced by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. West Penn's vegetation management includes the use of herbicides within transmission rights away, is consistent with the American National Institute standards, NERC standards, and industry best practices. West Penn also abides by the Integrated Vegetation Management Program. The IVM is based on the national standards published by the International Society of Orbiculture. As part of the IVM, compatible and incompatible vegetation is identified and appropriately controlled as evaluated, selected, and implemented. Compatible vegetation, which is not treated to reliability, is encouraged to grow, while incompatible vegetation is controlled. The use of herbicide is consistent with the IVM. 
The proposed herbicides have been approved for use in vegetation management on utility rights way by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. All contractors who apply herbicides must be registered and certified by an applicator by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Stump, <clears throat> stump cutting alone would result in more negative ecological damage impact to the right of way than the integrated plan that these both stump cutting and individual herbicide applications. The use of both manual cutting and herbicides and the most cost effective methods of vegetation management within the rights of way. As stated in the joint motion of West Penn's past and proposed actions do not violate any statute, regulation, or order of this commission. In fact, the proposed method of herbicide application to cut a stump was held to be reasonable by the commissions approximately a year ago. While the commission, as an administrative agency, is not bound by stare decisis, it must render consistent opinions in either follow, distinguish, or overrule prior precedents. While the joint motion cites this precedent in a footnote, it does not clearly follow, distinguish, or overrule this precedent. Rather, it proposes to establish a new type of commission proceeding to govern disputes over the use of herbicides. Instead of filing complaints, the joint motion proposes that this complaint in any other future disputes regarding the use of herbicides be converted to a petition for relief. In describing the need for this new process, it is noted that complaints have had a difficult time in meeting their burden of proving that certain proposed vegetation management practices are unreasonable. The commission will determine on a case-by-case -case basis whether an EDC can use herbicides. The commission will apply a, quote, totality of the circumstance standard to such petitions. This approach provides little, if any, certainty to the EDCs in the development and implementation of its vegetation management program. It also seems to conflict with the General Assembly's preference that EDCs adhere to and recognize industry standards. A stated in the joint motion does not find any violation of a, of a commission statute, regulation, or order has occurred, yet bars West Penn from using its preferred form of vegetation management. This result is in direct conflict with the longstanding applicable Commonwealth Court case precedent. In the prior decision involving a review of the complaint proceeding involving Section 1501, the Commonwealth Court said, and I quote, we hold that in order for the PUC to sustain a complaint brought under this section, the utility must be in violation of the duty under the section. Without such a violation by the utility, the PUC does not have the authority when acting on a customer's complaint to require any action by the utility. The record for this case is devoid of any evidence that the health and safety of Pennsylvania citizens or its environment have been harmed by the commission currently regulated regulatory scheme, EDC's use of herbicides as part of the vegetation management obligation. Before the commission adopts a new, policy, a new process for adjudicating these disputes, which affect all EDCs and retail electric customers, the commission should consult with stakeholders in an open and transparent process. We do wish to note that we are sympathetic to the current concerns raised by the complainant here. However, our decision in this case must be based upon the facts as established by the record and comply with applicable court precedent. Here, the substantial credible record evidence shows that West Penn's TVM program, including the use of herbicides to manage vegetation within the transmission right of way, is reasonable. We note the proper vegetation management within transmission rights of way is critical to ensuring our electric, grid operates in a safe and reliable manner. We further note that West Penn's program is based on industry best practices and West Penn commits to taking the necessary safety precautions when using herbicides within the right of way. West Penn even offered to test the complainant's water both immediately before and after herbicide application and a later date as may, as may be agreed upon. Therefore, we do not believe that West Penn's intended use of herbicides, as proposed in this case, violates the Public Utility Code and the Commission's regulations in order. Accordingly, because we find that the joint motion is not based on substantial evidence, appears to conflict with the applicable Commonwealth Court precedent and several provisions of the Public Utility Code and violates West Penn's rights to process, we must accept. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your indulgence this morning.
Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, on the joint motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. <clears throat> the joint motion passes three to two, noting the dissent of Commissioner Coleman and Commissioner Powelson. On the matter as amended by the joint motion, if there's no objection, we will take the previous roll call. Seeing none, the matter as amended passes three to two, noting the dissent of Commissioner Coleman and Powelson. Continuing on behalf of the Office of Administrative Law Judge, with regard to the complaint of Andrew Tomko versus Duquesne Light Company, there is the motion of Commissioner Sweet. Is there a motion to call up the matter for consideration? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Carlson, second by Vice Chairman Place. Under discussion, I recognize Commissioner Sweet for his motion. Thank you. This matter comes to the Commission's review <clears throat> as an initial decision of Administrative Law Judge Andrew Calvelli, ALJ, which sustains preliminary objections filed by Duquesne Light Company and dismisses the formal complaint of Andrew Tomko. Mr. Tomko states in his formal complaint that he is filing on behalf of 35 residents of a housing development and that he represents the interests of Plum Borough, Allegheny County. Duquesne filed POs in which it correctly points out that Mr. Tomko is not an attorney and is not permitted under Pennsylvania law to the, represent the interests of others in a formal adversarial proceeding. I agree with granting the POs to dismiss Mr. Tomko's claim that he represents others before the commission. However, I do not agree that Mr. Tomko's formal complaint should be dismissed at this stage of the proceeding. He should be given an opportunity to establish that he has standing to prosecute his own case, to present that case on his own behalf, and to develop an evidentiary record regarding his allegations. The question of his standing is a fact and dispute, and accordingly, dismissal is inappropriate. Therefore, I move that the initial decision sustaining preliminary objections and dismissing the complaint by Administrative Law Judge Andrew Cavelli be vacated. Two, that the case captioned Tomko versus Duquesne Light Company filed at docket number C-2016-257-7571 be remanded to the Office of Administrative Law Judge for proceedings consistent with this motion. And finally, that the Office of Special Assistance prepare an appropriate order. Thank you. You have heard the motion of Commissioner Sweet. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chairman Place. On the motion, any discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero on the case as amended by the motion. If there's no objection, we will take the previous roll call. Seeing none, the case passes as amended, passes five to zero. With that concluding the presentation of regular agenda items, we now turn to the commission's carry-in agenda. With regard to the first matter appearing on, at the top of page one, that being the uh, petition of the Duquesne Light Company for approval of its further amended 2017 through 2019 Universal Service and Energy Conservation Plan, there is the motion of Vice Chairman Place. Is there a motion to call up the case for consideration? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by... Commissioner Coleman, second by Commissioner Powelson. Under discussion, I recognize Vice Chairman Place for his motion. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please place this motion upon the record as if I'd read it in its entirety. Before the Commission for Consideration is Duquesne Light Company's Universal Service and Energy Conservation Plan for the years 2017 through 2019. I agree that the plan should be approved and implemented as it is in compliance with the Commission's March 2017 order and is the result of lengthy discussions and coordination with the company. However, consideration of the plan has raised a substantive issue with the Duquesne C Senior Customer Assistance Program, or Senior CAP. In 2011, as part of this rate case settlement, Duquesne limited eligibility for its CAP program to customers with incomes at or below 150% of the federal poverty level, but did not extend CAP eligibility to seniors age 62 and over with incomes between 150 and 200% of the federal poverty level. However, 
While no new enrollees with incomes between 150 and 200 percent of the federal poverty level would be accepted into the program, the settlement required that Duquesne, and I'm quoting, grandfather existing senior customers so that they will not be removed from the current benefits program so long as their income levels are at or below 200 percent of the federal poverty line level, end quote. Despite the adjusted eligibility criteria in the rate case settlement, neither the 2014 through 2016 nor the 2017 through 2019 plans contained any changes concerning the company's senior cap program. Duquesne, in its April 24, 2017 compliance filing, informed the commission that the company proposed to remove these previously grandfathered customers. As this provision had not been previously proposed, offered for public comment, or discussed with the parties of record, it was rejected by the Commission in its May 1, 2017 secretarial letter. However, Duquesne subsequently reported to the Commission's Bureau of Consumer Services that anywhere from 150 to 200 grandfathered customers had been removed from CAP in 2014 without prior notice, permission, or due process. Duquesne also indicated that it's working to identify the impacted customers, credit their accounts for retroactive benefits, and re-enroll eligible senior customers into CAP. However, the affected customer base and actual impacts of this change are not currently known. It is concerning that utility would act unilaterally in this matter. It appears that Duquesne has not abided by the provisions of a previously agreed to settlement and without additional commission approval and notification to other parties, changed the program with direct financial consequences on a particularly vulnerable population, those who are both elderly and low income. Thus, I am directing the Duquesne Light Company within 30 days of the entry date of this order to submit to the commission and parties to the 2000. 11 rate case, a corrective action plan, including a detailed impacts assessment, the number of customers and households impacted, the dollar value of the impacts, and a detailed plan for communication with and reimbursement for these households in an attempt to resolve this issue. Therefore, I move that. Duquesne Light Company's Universal Service and Energy Conservation Plan for the years 2019 through 2019, as filed on May 12, 2017, be approved. The Commission's Bureau of Investigation Enforcement is directed to evaluate Duquesne Light Company's removal of the grandfathered senior cap participants and provisions of the 2000 level. 2011 settlement agreement to take whatever further action may be warranted. Three. Duquesne Light Company, within 30 days of the entry date of this order, submit to the commissions, Commission and parties to the 2011 rate case a proposed corrective action plan, including a detailed impacts assessment, the number of customers, households impacted, the dollar value of the impacts, and a detailed plan for communication with and reimbursement for these households to satisfactorily resolve this issue. The Commission will provide an opportunity for comment on Duquesne Light's proposed corrective action plan. Four. The Commission's Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement provide a recommendation within 90 days of the entry date of this order regarding Duquesne Light Company's removal of the grandfathered senior cap participants. Five, the Commission's Bureau of Consumer Services provide a recommendation to the Commission regarding Duquesne Light Company's proposed corrective action plan, including consideration of comments received within 30 days of the close of the prescribed comment period. Six, Duquesne Light Company will complete implementation of their corrective action plan within 150 days after receiving commission approval. Seven, the Office of Special Assistance prepare an order, opinion and order consistent with this motion. Thank you. You have heard the motion of Vice Chairman Place. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> second by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. On the matter as amended by the motion, if there's no objection, take the previous roll call. Hearing none, the motion passes five to zero. Turning now to the matter involving the PPL Electric Utilities Corporation petition to withdraw. Uh, a previously filed amendment to the implementation date of its customer assistance program standard offer referral uh, program associated with its uh, default service plan four. There was the motion of Vice Chairman Place. 
Sarah, a motion to call up this matter for consideration. So moved. Sarah, second. second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Motion by Commissioner Coleman, second by Commissioner Sweet. <clears throat> Under discussion, I would recognize Vice Chairman Plates for his motion. Thank you, Chair. Madam Secretary, I ask that my motion be entered into the record as if I had read it in its entirety. Before the Commission today for consideration is the petition of PPL Electric Utilities Corporation for leave to withdraw its petition to amend the, an implementation date of the Customer Assistance Program Standard Offer Referral Program. PPL filed its petition to withdraw on May 8, 2017, stating that it recently determined that the company could fully complete the system changes necessary, necessary to implement the CAP SOP by the effective date of June 1, 2017. On May 12, 2017, the Retail Energy Supply Association filed a letter in opposition to the petition to withdraw, stating that it does not support commission approval of the petition without further commission action. Based on the proceedings in this matter, I support PPL's petition to withdraw its amended implementation date of the CAP SOP as the company has met the deadline of June 1, 2017 as prescribed by its plan. However, RISA raises certain operational issues that need to be addressed as PPL's CAP SOP is implemented over the next several months and years. It is important to note that RISA has filed a petition for review of the Commonwealth Court of the Commission's October 2016 and January 2017 orders with respect to our approval of the CAP SOP. In that appeal, RISA did not seek a stay of the implementation of the CAP SOP. RISA appropriately identifies several operational issues that should be addressed in the, in the implementation of the CAP SOP to avoid damage to Pennsylvania's competitive retail electricity market. The issues include lack of information on which EDS customers are receiving CAP benefits, how EGSs will honor existing customer contracts, particularly any cancellation provisions, how to maintain compliance with the Commission's regulations, particularly contract renewal provisions, and how to operationalize all these processes. Though PPL asserts that customers on month-to-month -month contracts need not be returned to default service, RISA has asserted that there is uncertainty on this issue. While our order does clarify some of these issues as it relates to month-to-month -month contracts, it is still not clear what processes will be needed to implement these directives. As PPL moves forward with the implementation of the CAP SOP, I believe that the company and the affected EGSs should meet to address and resolve any operational issues and details to <clears throat> enable all interested parties to coordinate the implementation and comply with the Commission's regulations. Therefore, I move that. One, the petition of PPL Electric Utilities Corporation for leave to withdraw its petition to amend the implementation date of the Customer Assistance Program Standard Offer Referral Program is granted. Two, within 30 days of the entry date of this order, the Office of Competitive Market Oversight will facilitate meetings with PPL Electric Utilities Corporation and the affected electric generation suppliers, including the Retail Energy Supply Association, to examine and resolve any operational issues that are integral to the implementation of PPL Electric Utilities Corporation Customer Assistance Program Standard Offer Pro Referral Program. Three, the Office of Competitive Market Oversight provide a status report of the discussions and the disposition of the implementation issues in this matter to the Commission within 90 days of the entry date of this order. And four, and finally, the Office of Final Special Assistance draft an opinion and order consistent with this motion. Thank you. You have heard the motion by Vice Chairman Place. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Sweet. On the motion, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero on the matter on the matter as amended by the motion. If there's no objection, we'll go with the previous roll call. Seeing none, the motion passes five to zero. Turning now to page two of the carrying agenda, it should be noted that the first case appearing at the top pertaining to Wenger Works Inc. T A T U K T U K Lancaster. I don't know if that's T U K or Tuck Tuck. Tuck Tuck. Tuck Tuck. Uh, has been postponed until public meeting of July 13th. 
We then have, Madam Chairman, your motion with regard to the ratification of appointments to the Consumer Advisory Council. Thank you very much. I ask that my, actually I'm gonna read the whole motion because it's not that long. But this is in, perp is in terms of ratification of appointments or recommendations for appointments to the Consumer Advisory Council. Whereas the Consumer Advisory Council is a viable and effective working organization and whereas the commission is mandated by regulations to officially appoint and or to ratify members to the council. Now therefore, it is resolved that the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, pursuant to 52 PA code section 94.4 C one through three, hereby ratifies and accepts the following appointments to the council for the term beginning July 1st, 2017 and continuing through June 30th, 2019. Recommendation of appointment by the governor is Sonny Popowski. Recommendation of appointment by Lieutenant Governor is Troy T. Dianopoulos. Recommendation for appointment by the Majority Chair of the Senate Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure Committee is Ralph G. Douglas. Recommendation for appointment by the Minority Chair of the Senate Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure Committee is Javier R. Taro. Recommendation for appointment by the Majority Chair of the House Consumer Affairs Committee is George J. Silvestri, Jr. And recommendation by appointment by the Minority Chair of the House Consumer Affairs Committee is Christopher Winters. And Commission at large recommendations are the following. Lillian Carpenter, Patrick M. Cicero, Timothy B. Hennessy, Chad Quinn, Dr. Tina M. Serafini, and Joseph E. Toner III. That is my motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Sweet. Any discussion on the recommended appointments? to the Consumer Advisory Council. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. Uh, Madam Chairman and Commissioners, that does conclude the presentation of public meeting agenda items for today. There's nothing else to come before the commission at this time. Seeing none, the meeting is adjourned.